Okay, as we uh, proceed with the message here, I titled the message Truth Compromise. And if you recall last message, I sp spoke about truth. What is truth? The, the Where do we get truth? And how the word, word of God is truth. God is truth. And truth, the whole absolute truth. So this morning, I would like to speak a little bit about compromised truth. Truth compromised. And how deception, how that works in against against truth, and how that how we can be deceived. I was going to start with a with a text in Genesis three one through seven, and you probably know this story well. It's the first, I believe, it's the first place we read of someone being deceived. The fall in in the garden, and that's where we faced a lot of why we face a lot of bad things and we maybe we would like to point the fingers at Adam and Eve and say why did you not behave yourselves why did you why did you not stay strong and we wouldn't face all these but I don't think any of us would have done any differently I don't believe we would have but I'm going to read let's read Genesis 3 1 through 7 and just thinking a little bit about where deception or about lying about deception and obviously the master deceiver was at work here now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made and he said unto the woman yea hath god said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden god hath said ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die and the serpent said unto the woman Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were <coughs> and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So as I read that, there was probably what most of us, if, if, someone, if, someone, if someone tells us something that we know is absolutely false, we're not too likely to swallow it, are we? We're, we're not likely to believe it. But it's that mixture where, where the mixture of truth and untruth come together that it becomes dangerous and that we are deceived now what he's now what the serpent says he says you shall not surely die now he was he was maybe he was referring and i'm not sure at this point adam and eve they they probably wouldn't have known they didn't know death they didn't know nobody at this point death was not had not happened yet and so they i don't know if they thought physical death but there was a there was a spiritual death that happened there you shall not surely die. So maybe in, in one sense, Satan was trying to convince them, yeah, you won't, you know, you won't fall over and die. But he also said, and I believe this is, this was tr very true, wasn't it? He said that for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. You're going to, uh, up to this point, they didn't, they didn't know evil. It's hard for us to comprehend. It's for me, anyhow, it's, it's difficult for me to, to think of a world without evil because we've we've never experienced it but up to this the world was everything was perfect wasn't it it was there was no there was no thistles there was no weeds there was no um, yeah there was it, it was just perfect and so he, he says that you're going to know you know the difference between good and evil and for some reason that was appealing obviously he says you'll be as god so it, it almost like it raises you to a to a higher, you know, you'll be a, a better person. You will know good and evil. So I believe what he said here was, in fact, some truth that he they would know good and evil. But knowing evil was not was not something that was to be desired. So he did have some truth there. How much? And as I thought of that, if we truth compromised, we're we're all, as I mentioned, something obvious we're very skeptical of 
and we're usually very careful. I, you know, if we, especially as we work on, on pole buildings, I don't get off the ground a whole lot anymore, but remember a lot of times running around on the, you know, up on the two by fours, you would, sometimes there would be a two by four and, and I still do sometimes when I'm handing up two by fours to the guys on the roof, I'll see, I'll see a place where it's, we would say the two by four is compromised where there's maybe, maybe there's a, saw cut that comes with a maybe a saw cut in it or maybe there's a bad knot in it and either we'll discard that one or i'll tell them be careful this one you know this one doesn't doesn't look the safest and i have had where that they have where and, and when, when we know that and we know where the where the two by four is compromised we know better than we well we shouldn't walk on that because it's very obvious but i have also been times that walking along and not realizing that that it was compromised and there was a letdown i down fell down through the um the two by four broke and we fell down so being aware of it creates creates uh um, something that's that it's obvious creates an, an awareness uh a, maybe we're skeptical of it and we're careful of it but unfortunately that's not always the case. That's not. And, and Satan is so good at hiding, hiding the good, hiding the evil, hiding the, the untruth in the good. So if we talk about the absolute truth, how much, how much does it take? How much untruth does it take to, I guess, to create how much, how much, untruth has to be put into truth to make it untrue just a little bit doesn't it if we and i trust this was i think as far as i know willie this was good water you didn't taint it with anything but um and i wouldn't i'm not afraid to drink of this we would say pure water but if i took if i took and if i took even a very small drop of poison or something that's not good for us that we know would would likely harm us and dropped it in there it might be it might be 99.9% you can't say pure can you sometimes sometimes i see and i don't i don't usually do grocery shopping but i know in the past i've i've noticed already like on maybe orange juice or something like that maybe it'll say um you know a certain percent pure 99% pure and i think that's that's really not if it's not 100% it's not pure is it so if we if we infiltrate, or if we put a little bit of impurity in here, that takes away from the pureness of it. But I can take, I can take untruth. Unfortunately, if we can take untruth and we put a little bit of truth in it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make the whole thing true. And am I willing? Sometimes, and, and sometimes we're willing, I'm afraid we're willing, way too willing when we, you know, we, we can hear it's, it's so, so easily done. We can, the, the, the messages, the, the preaching, the, the people that share their opinions on, on social media and those places, it's so easy just to take it all in and, and to just, yeah, just, just take it as truth. And I, thought, I think I was pretty clear about that on my last message, that we need to compare everything with the Word of God. So I'm not going to be speaking too much about that. But let's be very careful how much, how, um, how quickly we take something that is proclaimed to be truth. And, and Satan is so easily, Satan does so easily, he's so good at hiding deceptive, deception in that. Oh, but sometimes we hear the fact, well, we have to be open-minded. We have to, we have to be, and I, and I somewhat agree with that. We need to be, we need to be open to, um, to truths of God's word. If we're not living according, maybe we're not living according to God's word. I think, I think we need to be open to correction, to, um, to being taught on how we can better serve God, how we can better know truth. But I also think we must be careful that we're just not open-minded and we, we allow people's thoughts and, and people's, I, pro I probably, probably all of us have the same tendency. We, we twist, we, we like to take, 
I know, I know I've said this before. We like to take God's word and and make it apply to us, don't we? We want to we try to we want to live our life the way that we that we want to live it. And so we try to we go through here and we find we find verses. We can find places that that yeah that that condones what I'm doing. It's it's okay. And that's unfortunately what many people are doing is that to make it popular, to make the preaching, to make their preaching popular is to make it so that people can keep right on living the way they're living, but then they get the satisfied feeling that I'm all right with God. Galatians five verse nine. And, and again, with this thought of, of a little bit of, of poison, how it affects the pure water, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And once it's in there, if I would if I would take a drop of poison and put it in here and it would and it would go through this whole pure water, I couldn't I couldn't remove it again, could I? There is I believe there are filtering probably systems that you could go through, but I couldn't I take this little dropper and drop it in there. I couldn't get in there. It, it's it's in there. Have you ladies, I guess leaven as we think of leaven being yeast and you've um you bake bread. Have you ever, after the bread was ba baked, did you ever try to take the yeast back out? It's impossible, isn't it? You can't just go in there and and, may, and break open this loaf of bread and here's a here's a little nugget of yeast in there. So I'll just take that out and that that takes um, that takes it all out. No, it's something that infiltrates. So I believe again we need to be very careful as we as we study truth as we look for truth as we follow truth that we do not allow <clears throat> untruth deception to in, that it infiltrated with that a little bit of untruth a little bit of false teaching a little bit of impure thoughts is like 11 that can affect and change our whole being our beliefs so it's it's i think it'd be if we really think of how how a little bit, uh, how, if you think back over the last 15, 20 years, I trust we've, as, as in your Christian journey, I, I trust you, you would look back at that and see that you've grown closer, closer to God. But it's also, I, th I believe it's also shocking sometimes how, how much we can, with, with the way that the world is going and, and the way that the way the things that the world is teaching, how we can see that we have a tendency to to allow those to allow those teachings, those um, those, I guess, what makes us feel good. We allow those to affect the way that we that we are living today. So let's always be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Let's be very careful. I believe popular preachers. Or maybe conferences, or or rallies, or or whatever. Um, those, and I, I do, I do enjoy, I do enjoy speakers. You know, I um, I saw recently, I saw recently an ad of, of a uh, of a conference, or or I guess uh, some speakers that will be a, a number of speakers that will be will be sharing in a, um, I guess you would say a conference or in a, in a, motivational time, and it does it does look very interesting. There's some very um, very interesting people there that you know that I feel have have probably experienced a lot in life and are very good at um, at encouraging maybe maybe promoting promoting truth, but I'm I'm not sure how much do we how much do I accept that how much do I go just gung ho after those things, and if especially if we know that maybe there's some doctor they, they that they teach that they don't practice the whole word of God. I believe we need to be very, very firm that we that we practice and preach and teach and live the whole word of God. Do they preach the whole, whole truth? Or do we overlook the fact that maybe they're divorced and remarried? Maybe they're not non-resistant. Maybe they do not practice the head covering. Maybe do not, and, and modesty can be, and a whole host of things that can come in there that we believe are very, very important for us to live practices for us to live by and yet we're willing to overlook that let's be let's be very careful how much of that and as i as i thought of that how much of that can we 
you know, that we, if, if it's, if we know it's not the, if we're, if there's questions, whether it is the whole truth and if it is the whole truth, I think we need to embrace it and, and, and accept it. I think it can be a wonderful thing, but let's be very careful that we don't just embrace those and be a part of it because it will affect, I believe it will affect and it can affect our faith and our belief in the complete truth of God's word. Let's be, let's be rooted and grounded that this is the, this is the complete truth and that we need to live by it. I'm afraid sometimes that the popular charismatic emotional high experiences and I, and I, and I enjoy, I, I think it's wonderful. I don't, I don't want to have just a, I, I'm not looking for just a formal, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to just become formal in my life, but I believe that sometimes some of these, these popular teachings and these charismatic and emotional high experiences have replaced good, sound, fundamental truths that I believe we need to have our faith, our, have our lives based upon. And again, I want to repeat, I don't, I, it does not need to be formal. I don't believe it needs to be formal. I don't want to be formal, but I don't believe we need to have a big band up here playing playing music. I remember, I remember one time being at a church service where it's with, um, it was in a, I don't know, it was a multi-leveled, we would call it a mega church. And I remember the pastor saying that, so, commenting about the music and the music was loud and blasting and, and it was, people were very much into it. But I remember the, the preacher saying that we're, he said, next Sunday, we may, you come next Sunday. He said, we may have, we may have a jazz group up here. We may have, um, I don't remember. He had a list of, of singers that they might have up here. He said, we might have up there. We'll, we'll do whatever it takes to get people to come. Do we really need to compromise to get people to come? I don't believe we need to have a, a band up here. We don't need to have a party. We don't need, we don't need to have all that fun stuff to draw people. But I believe that as we, as people see, as, as the world sees us as solid, living the truth of God, that's what's going to draw them, I believe. What are some ideas? I believe here I have a couple, a couple thoughts, a couple, maybe some, um, some ideas that you've heard that I believe maybe, that may be some good ideas, but I believe there's could be some false mixed with it. One is we must be like the world to win the world. Probably a lot of us have, have heard that or, or observe, maybe observed it that, you know, we need to, in order for us to, to attract the, you know, the lost to, to our, maybe to our service or, or to be able to witness to them, we need to, we need to be like them. But I believe it's, if we, if we would talk, if we talk with those that are, that are seeking, they're, they're looking for something different. If they, if the world wants something like the world, they'll just stay where they're at, won't they? They, if they, but they want something different. And that's why they looking, looking at us. That's what they're looking for is, is something different. Someone that can relate well as a church, that we can relate well as families, that we can, um, they, they want peace. They want, they want to see love. They want to see, see those things. They want to see uh, a vibrant Christian walk of, of God and not someone that, not someone that is just like them. That's not really, that's not what the world is looking for. If it would be, they would, they can stay where they're at. Do I need to go to the bar and drink with the drunk in order to save him? No, we want to, he, the drunk wants something different. He doesn't, he doesn't want us sitting there beside him, drinking with him just to be witness with him. He wants something different. I believe another, another statement that is, that is something that sometimes that I feel there's falseness in it. The Holy Spirit tells someone to do something that is contrary to God's word. Oh, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. The Spirit, or maybe they don't even say the Holy Spirit. They say the Spirit told me to do this, or the Holy Spirit, maybe they do. Or maybe even uh, my pastor said this or that. The Holy Spirit conf confirms truth. It does not change it. The Holy Spirit confirms truth, the truth of God's word. It does not, it does not change truth. It does not change truth. It might convict me so that I need to change so that I live truth. I believe the Holy Spirit does that. And if I if I if I'm preaching something this morning, or if if someone, you know, and, and I think that goes for 
for any of us that that preach here in in this congregation or anything that we that we listen to that we hear that someone tells us we need to constantly we need to evaluate with the word of god is it is it truth does it line up with the word of god we need the holy spirit to direct us and correct us but it will never be contrary to god's word we we need both the spirit and truth I thought of, as I thought of that, when we think of someone that, there was two instances that I thought of in the, in the scripture where, where people used God's as, somewhat as, used God as, or as a message from God to, to deceive someone. One was when Ehud told Eglon, and Eglon was the, was the Midianite, I think he was the Midianite king that was, that had, taken over Israel and they were, they were being, Israel was in bad situation there. And so Ehud goes into Eglon. Eglon was this big fat man. And Ehud goes in there and he told him that I have a message from God. And, the, and when Ehud or when Eglon heard he had a message from God, I think it said he, he arose or he leaned forward to speak in his ear, to hear it in his ear. He had told everyone to go out that he had a message from God. And when, when Eglon moved forward to hear this message from God, and Ehud stabbed him. It was very deceptive. The other one I had to think of was when the young, was it when the prophets, and I should have looked that up. I didn't even um, look that story up. But when the, when the prophet was told to go back to Israel, was it to go back to Israel, I believe, and not to stop, not to stop by the way. And then the, old, the older prophet um, stopped him and said, you know, hey, come over here. And um, I, God, I think, didn't he say God told me? He even, he even used it kind of as a message from God, that God told me that you're supposed to stop in for, for a meal here for the night. And, and so the, the prophet did, and it was, it was not, did not go well with him. I believe the lion got him then. So, so just because someone tells us that God is, God is telling me, that this is a message from God. We still need to be very careful. We need to be very careful and still align that with God's word. How about the one that the scripture was only for the time for for their their time and is not applicable for us today? That's so very that's very easy to do, especially as we as we try to confirm our lifestyle, confirm confirm the lifestyle that many people want to live and they want to confirm it with the word of God. I think that's a very popular uh, deception. That is a very popular statement, a very popular belief that, that people, or that at least that people try to believe or try to make, make us believe that the scripture was written for, for this time, 2000 years ago, and it's not applicable for us today. But I believe, I trust how many of us, are, con are, are we all convinced that the word of God is for us today? How many of us are convinced about that, that it is for us today? Amen. Let's, let's live it. Someone once made the statement, when anything goes, everything goes. And this could go back a little bit to this statement of being, when I talk about being open-minded and, and I, and, and as we just as we're open to any teaching, any any thought that that someone that someone brings in, or maybe um, maybe the way that they um, it, that scripture is twisted. And once we start being open to that, and someone once said, "When anything goes, everything goes." And I believe when when we would look at at some of the some of the churches, if we look at churches today that would practice that would have probably have. Uh, women preachers that would have, um, well, they have gay leaders. They have divorce and remarriage. They have um, what a whole host of things that that where where churches are openly accepting that today. Whereas probably twenty five, I don't know, was twenty five years ago even maybe maybe be longer than that. So I don't know that you can exactly what time frame. But there's there's probably some churches that are practicing those things today that 25 years ago would not have even, they, they would have said there was no way. There's no way. I think that goes with this thought of when anything goes, everything goes. Once we start entertaining the thought that the scripture is not applicable for us today, we start twisting it to, to confirm our lifestyles 
and then soon everything everything is going and we become we get to a situation where we never expected ourselves to be second corinthians 11 let's look at second corinthians 11 13 through 15 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves. Or, or no, it's, it's no wonder, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. So what I see here is not only is Satan, and we started, we started the message with Satan and his deception in the Garden of Eden, and he's, he's continued to be... There's, there's absolutely no way that anyone that we can ever, ever trust Satan, no matter, no matter what he promises. But he's, he, he comes pretending to be an angel of light, and he's also using his, his workers. It says there in verse 15, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. So Satan is not only, you know, if Satan would come to us with this, fork tail and a pitchfork or whatever um, picture we have of Satan, if he would come to us with that and tell us, you know, to, to go do something, um, you know, go do something wrong, we would say, no, there's, there's no way. But Satan is, Satan is so deceptive and he's, and he, and he, so he sends his, his minister. He doesn't come to us in that way, but he sends his, his workers, his workers that have, uh, they look good. They might dress right. They might, on the on the yeah they may they may seem like everything about them is good but there's there's deception and their their desire is to draw people away and to and to twist the truth of God's word and to make us comfortable with a life that is not lined up with God's word that's what it's all about satan wants us to be comfortable in the life we're living if it's not that it's not against if it's living against God's word. And there's a, I think I mentioned this before as well, probably, but there's kind of a, almost seems like there's a test that would, I, I find to be true that if I, if Satan isn't tempting me, and unfortunately this is the case, we would, we would like to think that the, that the, that the Christian life is, it, there's just no temptations, but I don't find it that way temptations there's a good chance that i'm a christian if i'm not if 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 everything if i don't if if you say this morning if you tell me this morning that i don't face temptations i would really question whether you're living a christian life i wish i would have to say that but i think it's the truth i think it's just the mat fact of the matter that as christians we will face temptations because satan wants us to be comfortable and and if he has us where he if he if he has us where he wants us if he has us if if he has if he sees us you know that we are going down that path that is taking us to destruction if he sees that he wants us to be comfortable in that and so he'll he won't he won't be trying to draw us away from that he'll just comfort us in that and so that's where i believe where he also brings his false teachers and his false ministers to make us comfortable in that journey. On November 18th, 1970, and some of you older ones, I was only three, year olds, three, year old, three years old, but maybe some of you older ones would remember that. Do you remember of Jim Jones and Jonesboro, I think I think they call it Jonesboro. It was I I wasn't I guess I wasn't even I I didn't even I don't think I was even aware of it until I was doing some studying and I was into this um, into deception and and it was quite a horrible thing the way I understand. In nineteen November eighteenth in nineteen seventy eight, Jim Jones and over nine hundred of his followers died in a mass suicide murder. He took them and I didn't I did a little bit of study on it, but. The way I understand it was kind of a cult that was in California that this Jim Jones was was over. 
overseeing, and he persuaded uh, many of his followers to to follow to move to Guyana in South America with him. And on November 18, 1978, he obviously he evidently convinced them that life would be it would or the world would be better without them. I'm not sure. I didn't. I don't know what all his his thinking was or what all how all he convinced them to do this. But and some of them some of them were actually forced forced to. Um, there was actually evidence, I guess, that some were actually that were actually murdered that refused to drink. Maybe they refused to drink. But he took Kool Aid and laced it with cyanide, the way I understand. And they were, um, and he he persuaded somehow either persuaded them. Or they were some of them were actually injected with with poison to kill them, and over nine hundred of his followers died in that mass suicide. But previously, and I'm not sure how, if and and previously, and I'm several years previously, he had he was testing them to see how loyal they were to him. So he he again he took Kool Aid, and he told his followers that there was cyanide in here in this Kool Aid. And he told them to drink it and to kind of test, I guess, to see how loyal they were. And he lied to them. It wasn't, there was no cyanide in them. So they drank this Kool-Aid and everything was fine. So I don't know if, if there was actually, could there have been when this actually happened, could there have actually have been people that were, that were deceived by his, by his having lied earlier that, that maybe drank it because they didn't expect it to have cyanide in it. But unfortunately, many, many people lost their lives due to his deception. You wonder, sometimes you wonder if when you, when you look at those cults and those, those things that, um, and, and the horribleness of those, you wonder how, how can people, how can people continue on following those lies year after year? Yet we have the master deceiver that we just read about here in second Corinthians, he continues to deceive, and yet there's people just following and just lie after lie, and and they continue following. You know the billboards when you when you look at the when you look at the and and I think they've really cracked down on some of the billboards. But at some point there was at one time there was many billboards about about smoking cigarettes. I don't think they're I'm not sure that they're allowed to anymore, but they don't. You know, they would show and, and maybe and in magazines as well, they wouldn't they, they show it as a glamorous thing, drinking and smoking and, and living a, a corrupt life. They show it as being as being glamorous. They don't they don't show the millions that are suffering because of of cancer or or emphysema or all those all those all the things that go with with smoking. They don't they don't show the shacks and the squalid living of the drunken man, the broken homes and the desolate children that are affected by the drunken and for good reason, because if they would show that they probably wouldn't, their sales wouldn't be good. So they hide it behind this glamorous. So let's be very careful as we are exposed to much teaching, teaching to much information wherever it may be. It could be in books. It can be, it could be online. Let's be very careful and compare it with the word of God because the little deception, a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. And it takes, it doesn't take very much. And we can start questioning. We can start questioning the, the doctrines of God's word, the foundation of God's word. And we start questioning and we're going down a road that we do not want to go. A verse in closing, 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I think it's so important. And as I mentioned in my last message, we need to know, in order to know, in order to know falsehood, we need to know the word of God. So let's be diligent. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Let's study the word of God. Let's know what is truth. That way, when something that is false comes, comes by, we will know what it is and we can reject it. Let's kneel for prayer. Dear God, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for the clarity of it. Thank you that we can, as we live by it, you are, um, you confirm that with your Holy Spirit and that you, um, yeah, that you, you do correct us. You do 
convict us, Lord, when we when we go astray. Thank you for that. Help us to be very cautious. Help us to be very careful of the master deceiver, and that we don't that we not convince or we're not persuaded by by the deception that he so subtly hides in in truth. Lord, we pray that you would help us. We go through life to be a light and a witness to the hurting world around us, to those needs among us, those the sick ones as well. Lord, we just pray for, again for health for those that were that were mentioned. And may you help us in our journey of life to be totally true to you, to live according to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to turn the time over to Brother Matt to close.